You, 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 you recently wrote an article for us, for uh, Renovatio, and uh, you make an argument about uh, poetry. So maybe you could just give us a little summation of that. Certainly. Uh, I'm very interested in the topic of the, of the issue, about what, what makes a human being a human being. And I wanted to identify language, which I quite naturally uh, rushed to, as that which makes us uh, human, and um, i.e. We, we are the animal with language. But then I was remembering encountering uh, this mark, remarkable text uh, at the beginning of Putnam's Art of Posey. And, and in it, he, he clearly sees language as central uh, to humanity, uh, that, that really constitutes our humanity as such. But uh, he does not focus on the, uh, the rhetorical aspect as much as on the poetic, right. which I found really interesting. Uh, and so I wanted to explore a reading of his text uh, and to just draw from what he says uh, an, an argument about why it may be that it's poetry that actually makes us human, a particular form uh, of language, which I think he does associate with mm. rhetoric. Um, but he tends uh, and continues to throughout it to emphasize uh, poetry itself. Right. And uh, I decided after following his reasoning that he thinks this is the case because poetry is a particularly concentrated form of ordering language, uh, metrically, stanzaically, figuratively. And I've begun to see that he thinks that that ordering has a way of reordering the human soul of the one who participates in poetry right. and then reorders the, the soul uh, of, of others as well. And so it becomes a social order. And I was really quite uh, stunned to see that Putnam thinks that poetry more or less makes us human uh, by remaking us through hmm. uh, the poetic art itself. Right. Um, one, of, one of the interesting things about human beings is that I don't think there's a culture or a civilization that doesn't have poetry. That's right. It, it's, a, it's really an argument for a, for a universality of nature, that, that there is a, a human nature. Beca and, and the interesting thing is almost every peoples and cultures, certainly the ones, all the ones that we know, ha have, the poetry is very similar. It's about mm. three seconds for each um, li uh, line, mm. and it begins hundreds of years uh, before. I mean, we have recorded poetry from China uh, in, in uh, like, I think 500 BC, and Homer, obviously, in, in, the, in the Greek tradition is even earlier. And another aspect that to, fascinates me personally is that arguably every single civilization, because we have Aboriginal peoples, mm -hmm. and then we have p city people, people that create um, civilizations of very complex aggregates of people living together, and that all of those civilizations are prefaced with great poetry. Mm. Uh, so, for instance, if you look at uh, the Greeks, I don't think I think it's arguable that you don't, you cannot have Plato or Socrates without Homer, mm. and and the number of times that they quote Homer That's right. as a as a source book, and in in the uh, in the Islamic tradition, the very first book is the Quran, but the Quran is preceded in almost immediately. Uh, the, 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 the hundred years before the Quran is the pinnacle of Arabic poetry. Mm. And right before the, the, the Quran emerges was considered, they had reached their acme mm. uh, of poetic prowess. Um, the famous odes, the seven odes that hung in the Kaaba. These mm. were the great, uh, they call them Qasida. And, and then if you look at European civilization, I mean, arguably our in Norton's anthology, it begins with the Song of Roland. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. our literature begins with the Song of Roland. And then the, the English 
Shakespeare is and Marlowe and all these great poets, Ben Jonson, they precede the the King James Bible. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just amazing that the King James Bible, which is arguably what, what created um, English civilization. I mean, Chaucer uh, before that, and Beowulf even before that. But arguably, uh, the King James Bible does so much for America. Without the King James Bible, we don't have Abraham Lincoln. We don't have uh, so many of the rhetorical uh, greatness that the civilization produced. Yeah, the, the point about Homer is extremely interesting because it immediately raises the question of what do we mean by poetry? Uh, and on the one hand, we do mean measured speech. And okay, so, so we are, the term, right, yeah. yeah, we are talking about uh, dactylic hexameter um, verse. Uh, so on the one hand, we recognize that Plato's own understanding of music is itself arising from right. uh, Homeric poetry that is is uh, musical accompanied or not uh, since with the lyre exactly yeah. because meter meter itself is a kind of liar within the language sure um but then of course uh, homer is also a mimetic artist so not just that it's verse but that it's uh, mimetic or representational of human of human action and what i find tremendously compelling about the antagonistic relationship between uh, homer and especially plato uh, and you're absolutely right, Socrates uh, will quote, uh, the, Socrates the character will quote uh, Homeric verse regularly. But what I find so intriguing is that it's quite clear that Plato, uh, arguably the, the first writer of philosophical texts, is clearly imitating Homer. Um, and not just uh, topically, but by fashioning works uh, that have been influenced by Homeric fashion. Sure. I mean, one of the things I like to point out to students is Maybe that... Maybe that's why he wanted the poets exiled so they wouldn't see... Yeah, no, that's right, that he was stealing from them. <laughs> uh, but also that he's fashioning a new form of poetry. Sure. It seems naive uh, yeah. to me uh, not to recognize that when he critiques Homer as a poet in the Republic, he knows that his audience realizes that the Republic itself is mm. a poem. It's narrated right. by Socrates, who's right. the dramatized narrator. He says, I went down to Piraeus the other day. And you realize that if you were to explore Greek literature and ask, where have we heard someone tell their own tale before mm. about going down, it becomes quite clear that he realizes that his audience will know that he's imitating, he's imitating Homer's representation of Odysseus telling his own tale at the Phaeacian court. And so uh, I think that Plato actually wants to write a new form of poetry, mm. but the condition of possibility for that is, 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 clearly, is clearly Homer. And it's that, that quality of making, uh, making music, yeah. of fabricating uh, through this mimetic art of representation uh, worlds, fictional worlds, sure. uh, in which we can participate and observe and be moved by characters who, who are not people but resemble people, that draws us into a kind of intelligibility of, of human action and our, our compassion so often in response to, the, to their suffering that, uh, that I think may actually be central to humanity, which might indicate why it's universal. Right. Why, indeed, uh, storytelling in some form or another uh, is, uh, is there in every culture we encounter. And I think a lot of people have pointed this out throughout the ages, that we speak rhythmically, that we human do. language is by its very nature rhythmic. A lot of people are completely unaware that Shakespeare is actually in verse. It's true. It's <laughs> because true. it's so natural. To be or not to be, that is the That's question. Right. It, it just it, it flows trippingly off the tongue. It does indeed. And, and You can scan parts of Lincoln and Melville too, absolutely. by the way. I, I mean, you, you can scan parts of what we're saying. Um, no doubt. It's, it's just, especially iambic, because this is the... The, 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 uh, the meter of the English language tends to fall into the iambic. But... The, the use of meter in conveying meaning, and before, because I want to extend about poetry, 
extend it beyond verse mm -hmm. because certainly it, it the, you know, the Greek concept, it comes from a word which is basically about artifice mm -hmm. to create something, to make something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and certainly imaginative literature is all, um, if it's good, if it's great, it, it, it reaches a level of poetry. But the epic poem, which obviously Homer is our greatest in, in, in Western civilization, um, the epic poem, uh, it's, there's so few people who have been able to do it. Mm. And it's been tried many times. <laughs> um, the last time, we, ha we, we actually had a character, uh, character in early American history, Joel Barlow. Hmm. Do, you, do you? I don't know. He's Barlow. famous for a poem called Hasty Pudding, which huh. is very often anthologized. Uh -huh. um, uh, he was part of the Connecticut Wits. Uh -huh. He was a friend of George Washington. But he had aspirations to be an epic. He wanted to be America's epic poet hmm. and and he attempted but uh, it's it's it was a failed attempt and um, it's it's just very interesting the what's called the noble voice you know that that was mm -hmm. one of Stringfellow Barr I think wrote a book called the noble voice of, oh no Van Doren actually about yeah. the epic poem why is the epic poem so difficult to to do no that's a wonderful that's a wonderful question uh, at least in literary studies we tend to assume that the epic poem um, Took up, uh, took up residence, if you will, in the novel, and so that the novel began to uh, do the work of, the epic, poem. of, of yeah. the epic poem. But what's interesting about that is that the novel is uh, really quite essentially composed of prose. Uh, yeah. its, its body, if you will, is a prosy body, right. uh, whereas the, the epic poem uh, is, in, is in verse. And so a lot of people will suggest that, um, uh, that maybe, for example, Wordsworth's prelude uh, was the last great epic. But we actually, I think, live in an age of a great epic poem, Derek Walcott's Omeros, which is a magnificent uh, treatment of life in, uh, um, in the Caribbean and, uh, and takes up a number of questions and does so by means of a, a central character named Achille, uh, clearly named for uh, Achilles, and is always running a Homeric parallel along his own mm. quite distinct contemporary uh, Caribbean culture. Dante, too, is quite influential in that, in that poem. But I, I think it's very difficult to do, uh, of course, in part because um, readers are not accustomed to reading verse uh, as often as they used to be and expect their stories to be in, in prose. Mm. So when people uh, read literature, they tend to presume that means reading novels. Uh, imaginative, imaginative literature uh, is, I won't say it's reduced to novels, but that's, that really is the form of literature people well, uh, most gravitate sure. toward. In part because we haven't um, taught enough people uh, uh, recently how to, write, how to, write re how to read it. and to write. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. right. Yeah. One of the things it about, is an art that has to be taught. One of the things about, well, not necessarily. I mean, there, there are people that do naturally. The Arabs are, are amazing at that. I, I, I know some pretty sophisticated uh, Arabic uh, poets mm -hmm. that that really don't know the prosody of, of the, the, and it's, it's like Greek, it's not syllabic. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, it's not accentual. Mm -hmm. It's, it's related to the actual duration uh, of the word. So it's long, short, as opposed to uh, light, heavy, or heavy, lighter, heavy, heavy. That doesn't light. surprise me though, actually, mm -hmm. because uh, as you were saying, uh, it, it indicates poetry itself indicates some natural talent for it, right. which means that the measure in language is natural to language. Yeah, exactly. And some people will have an extraordinarily uh, well, musicians. Uh, powerful natural yeah. gift with or without training. Mm. Um, but, uh, but, but art, uh, art will improve it. Right. So, um, even those without, uh, as much talent can have that sure. talent improved through art. Uh, you often hear about musicians, uh, that we would recognize as clearly quite talented who don't know music. My first thought is always, what if they did? How would it change? Um, how would it? Music? How would it yeah. change? Uh, what would be the accomplishment um, if all four of the Beatles actually knew yeah. how to read music? Yeah. 
Um, well, I, um, Yusuf Islam, Cat Stevens, uh, I heard him once say that he, he found it so difficult to learn other people's music, uh -huh. so he just decided to write his own. <laughs> and, and I thought that was re really interesting because uh -huh. one of the things about classical musicians is that, that all they, they start from day one learning mm -hmm. not really how to make music, but how to imitate music. And, mm -hmm. and this is something the, the pre-modern world was obsessed with, with mimesis, with, mm -hmm. with artifice, with, mm -hmm. with actually... Uh, one, one of the things that was very common, they, the idea of creative writing would have been insane to, to anybody before the 20th century. The, the idea that you could teach people how to write, what you could teach them to do was how to imitate. Yeah, exactly. And, and so they would, you know, have a sentence like, when in the course of human events, and then they'd have to, the student would have to write a sentence with completely different words, but mm -hmm. following the form of That's that right. sentence. And, and so artifice was not a negative thing, whereas today it's become a very negative thing. And I think one of the tragedies of a lot of modern, um, uh, especially the young people, I, I, I actually think it's, it's really uh, unfair to them to encourage them to write poetry mm -hmm. because 99.9% .9 of it is, is tripe and, mm -hmm. and they're not, because their self-esteem has to be boosted, mm. we're not allowed to actually say that's doggerel and it's mm -hmm. complete rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, we have to say, well, gee, that's wonderful, great, mm. you know, way to go. And uh, instead of doing the traditional way, which would have, they would have memorized great poetry right. and, and internalized it. I mean, we talk mm -hmm. about learning something by heart. Mm -hmm. And it's such a beautiful idiom, the idea of internalizing something. And, and one of the things that, um, the Arabs say that if you want to be a great poet, memorize the corpus of a great poet and then forget it. That's right. And I think Dylan, to me, who, you know, there's a lot of debate about Dylan, but I, I really do think he, he, he's, he, he will be in the canon. That's my personal oh, indeed. view. Indeed. And, and, and there, there are people like uh, Ricks. At Christopher Ricks. Christopher Ricks yeah. and others. I just read a book about him, Why Dylan Matters, from a Harvard professor mm -hmm. um, making that argument. And I think the, Dylan, when he came to New York, I think he knew 200 Woody Guthrie songs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he was basically a Guthrie imitator yeah. uh, using Ramblin' Jack Elliott's um, style. And then the other major influence on him was um, Hank Williams, yeah. who is also a, a really, uh, I mean, I think quite an extraordinary lyricist. Rick's makes a makes a. I've heard Rick's make this case actually in public that uh, uh, that he thinks he's influenced as well by a number of a uh, number of poets, including including Eliot. This this dynamic. Well, he read. I mean, yeah, yeah, he, he read. read. He read Verlaine Rimbaud. He was he, uh, Rimbaud no, he definitely didn't. had a big impact. This on dynamic him. of of uh, imitation uh, up to uh, a habit. Right. And then a habit which is no longer consciously imitating and then becomes innovative, right. I think, is actually the classical model for, right. uh, for education, for education itself. It's interesting that we're talking about uh, teaching people how to write, but of course, we also want to make readers. And so I think because of a, a fear, frequently, of the massive technical vocabulary that's often involved in prosody, in prosody yeah. Uh, people will be worried, if you will, about sure. about uh, introducing mm -hmm. young people to to poetry. But I think it's a mistake yeah. because, for for one thing, um, you cannot suppress it. Right. Uh, so so in fact, the desire for rhyme, which is a different kind of uh, accord yeah. than than Although meter. Although most most poetry globally is is in blank verse, yeah. so rhyme is is Chinese poetry is. Definitely, the Arabs are obsessed with rhyme. Yeah. You know, there's a great scene in um, Dead Poet Society where um, the character that's played by Robin Williams, um, Robin yeah. Williams rips out that you know that kind of uh, Cartesian analytic approach, the X and the Y uh, bar, yeah, that's right. how to that's determine right. whether a poem is great. And um, even though the message of that film I didn't like, but but that one scene I really appreciated because I remember very clearly the first time a poem hit me in the gut. Yeah. Like I was in eighth grade hmm. and, and, and it was a literature class. I, we, I was actually at a progressive school where they had four quads. Mm -hmm. And so based on your aptitude, you went like they had a quad for, it, it was actually pretty horrific now when I think about it, this social engineering. Yeah. But uh, they had a quad for math and science. They had a quad for 
uh, arts and music and things. And then they had a quad for um, just like vocational. <laughs> these are like eighth yeah, graders, yeah, that's right, seventh that's and eighth right. graders. So for, the students were divided by yeah, these no, quads. By, and so yeah. I was in the language arts um, mm -hmm. quad. Um, but I remember clearly reading Ozymandias mm. and it was yeah. just, it just really affected me in, yeah. a, in such a deep way. And that was the first time a, a poem had ever done that That's to true. me. And well, I was just going to say... Um, I and I don't think had it been explained to me in that X, Y right. type thing, it wouldn't... It, it, it was a gut reaction. I think the question isn't whether, but when, pedagogically. Uh, I, actually, I actually do think that uh, we should bring uh, the art uh, to, the, to the students. On the other hand, I, no, I we, have, you, yeah. we have to do it in a way that actually doesn't kill the, uh, doesn't the, kill the, the spirit, love, the spirit uh, yeah. um, that, that, uh, that recognition that you right. had in your heart. Uh, well, it's that, like rhetoric. I mean, you indeed. know, one of the things about rhetoric that when you learn all the tricks, mm -hmm. it can it can it can almost take the magic it out can. of it. But it, but if 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 you if you, it can also have the opposite effect where you really appreciate the artifice, where you really appreciate yeah. what a master is doing, and and when they're when they're true masters, there's a reason why. Somebody like Frost will go from an iamb to an anapest. Yeah. In in, I mean, he knows yeah. what he's doing because to him, the 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 form was actually sometimes. He said that a, a great poet for him, the form is surpasses the importance of the content, and and I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think I think Shakespeare. I mean, you can see Shakespeare is having fun with language. Mm -hmm. You know, he's mm -hmm. you can see his tongue in cheek. You know. Uh, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a, a horse. horse. I mean, you can hear the horse trotting in, <laughs> in, in, in that, you know, and yeah, it's yeah. such a wonderful, um, so to understand what he's doing, yeah. you know, with like a kind of spondy yeah. type of... And you, it's interesting that you said you can hear it, which means that, uh, that memorization is not enough. Actually, what we want to do, I think, as well, uh, is that once uh, a student has memorized a poem, we want them to deliver it. We want them to recite it. And it's there, I think, where the vocabulary comes in right. as a useful way to explain uh, the, the recitation that they're, that they're doing. I think we don't do enough with delivery, unfortunately. Uh, delivery is very important. And we it's, live it's in, almost nixed from the canon. No, that's right. Yeah, we, live in a, we live in a loud culture. Right. Uh, the volume may not have yeah. ever been this high mm. uh, in mm. human culture. But the discrimination of sound from sound yeah. uh, I think is the Actio more and more Memoria, lost. The last two canons are really, they've been nixed. And... And there, it's. I mean, all of it really. Very yeah. few people learn uh, the invention, which is so central. I mean, the, the, the you know the first and and the, the dominant you know definition, but then comparison, mm -hmm. and 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 in the in the in the uh, in the topics of invention, comparison is is that's the bread and butter of great poetry. The mm -hmm. conceit, mm -hmm. finding two things that are so dissimilar mm. and yet bringing them together in a way that's the aha mm -hmm. moment. Shall mm. I compare thee to a summer's day? Mm. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, in the Poetics, Aristotle says, and this I think actually confirms something you were saying before, he says that the power of, of metaphor uh, can't be taught. And I'm not convinced of that, by the way, right. uh, but it's a very interesting idea that in, indeed the ability to see um, counterintuitive likenesses, right. uh, which then become quite intuitive, uh, is, is a real gift. Um, but there's no, doubt, there's no doubt about it. Figuration, figuration is crucial and metaphor, metaphor central. But I, I still think a lot about this need to ask students to, to stand and to deliver, uh, to use another teacher movie that, uh, right. that I enjoy. And that is to ask them to speak. Because what the I. The office of assertion. No, that's right. right. Uh, more and more, what I find is that, the, uh, that students will. Uh, that was a plug for your book. Thank you. I, way, I yeah. appreciate that. Go ahead. Yeah. 
um, the students more and more actually have trouble uh, articulating uh, them themselves. Right. And again, it's not because they don't have uh, often uh, quite very intelligent and interesting things to say, mm -hmm. but they're frequently intimidated by public public discourse. Sure. They're exceptions, no doubt. Uh, it seems to me that the that the, uh, any number of young people who are who are particularly naturally gifted right. at it, yeah. but I think to to ask them to memorize um, so that they don't have to access their right. phone, uh, sure. but yeah. to ask them to memorize and to ask them to recite yeah. and to recite artistically, sure. I think is is itself a great gift because at that point they're being given their own voice, right. but it's a voice that's being educated uh, by by poetry itself. I, I make students memorize to their chagrin in every class that I do. They have to memorize. And I incorporate poetry and all. I, I had my, when I taught astronomy, I had a book on all the, the poetry to deal with the stars. <laughs> so, um, and when I taught ethics, they read uh, The Merchant of Venice. Uh -huh. So I always, I always have poetry and, and, yeah. and bring it in and incorporate it. I think it's really important. Uh, I think one of the things about Did you use uh, Sonnet 116 for the, for the astronomy course? I, I, can't, I can't remember. Yeah. I, I actually had a book that was just poems about the stars. Yeah. But um, w one of the things about poets, I think, is they just have brilliant ears because people are saying poetic things all the time. They Little are. children are saying poetic things. Yeah. I, was, I was at the grocery store the other day, and there was this elderly, I think she was probably Filipino-American uh, lady, um, and she she was a little plump, mm -hmm. and and she was in front of me, and her and her husband, uh, or significant other, um, showed up. She was about to buy things, and he showed up with a Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia, you know. <laughs> and she looked at it, and just her eyes lit up, and she said, "Oh, my favorite!" And she said, "But I've gained so many pounds eating that." But happy pounds, <laughs> and I just, I just thought, man, what a great, you know. And I, I think that's what Dickens was able to do. He just listened to people's yeah. conversations because one of the things that that's so clear from great poets is their characters are so different. Yeah. You know, and a bad writers always you you feel the sameness that's right. in the characters, whereas great writers are clearly. I, I once saw somebody who was reading um, Dostoevsky's um, The Brothers Karen was up at the airport. So I just said, how's that book going for you? And he just, he, he put it down. He looked up and he said, this is not fiction. <laughs> it's like, exactly. That's right. It's, and that's what great poetry is not fiction in that way. It's like mythology. You know, it's the yeah. mythos. My father's definition of mythology was too true to be believable. Oh, that's right. right? Yeah. And 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 I think um, I Dylan, you know, there's there's a there's an old skit from a um, from a, a program where where they have Dylan at um, Woody Guthrie's bedside. Hmm. Did you ever see that? No. What where we, you know they're actors and he says, "How's things going, Woody?" And he's like. The answer is blowing in the wind, and Dylan's <laughs> writing it down. And he said, "You know, he said I'm so sad to see you in this." He yeah. said, "Don't think twice. It's all right." He's like writing it down, and you know, it's it's obviously making fun of. Uh, Ginsburg once asked him, "Do you think you'll ever be tried as a thief?" Huh. And and um, but I think that's what Dylan had that ear. You know, I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. I can hear somebody saying that in a conversation. Definitely. And 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 he's got his notebook out. So it's I think that's the in some ways the gift of the poet is that he, they're showing us something about the world that we 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 might not have thought about. It's like Van Gogh cuz painting is a type of poetry as well. You know, when Van Gogh paints sh old shoes mm. and you it, it forces you to look at those shoes and you'll never look at a pair of old shoes the same way. No, that's right. And I, I, a friend of mine, we were in West Africa. Uh, he's a brilliant photographer, um, Peter Sanders. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he took a picture of this old ladder mm -hmm. that, that was literally two sticks mm -hmm. with other sticks tied together on a rope and it was mm -hmm. up against an adobe house. Mm -hmm. And this was... 
it was a, a primordial ladder, mm-hmm. right? R- really mm. just, it must have been, the first ladder must have looked <laughs> like that. And I actually had seen that yeah. ladder several times, but I never really looked at it. Yeah. And his photograph forced me That's to right. think about that, that. And I think, you know, when, when Emily Dickens is, says something like, there's a certain slant of light, right. winter afternoons, yeah. that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes. That slant of light, winter afternoons, will never be the same no, for that's you. That's right, and we all know it. Yeah, but now exactly. we know it in a new way. In a new way. And that, that's the, con- con- you know, the conceit there of, of death and you know, the, the declining day of a winter afternoon. But I think that's the paradox of, of poetry, that though it frees itself uh, from the real, it ends up uh, revealing the real. Uh, and so what I have more and more come to believe is that Aristotle is right, that, that poetry is actually more philosophical than history, yeah, that, because it's not it bound. It does with the universal. It does. It's not as bound to uh, the actual particulars. Yeah. And in that imaginative yeah. transformation is a displaced representation that we then can encounter uh, without the difficulty of encountering ourselves directly. Well, and that's the catharsis. I mean, that was the whole event, whatever was happening at the amphitheater in mm-hmm. Greece, the experience. I mean, these were really religious experiences and, and the, the, the revelation that occurs, not just in the play, but in the, the spectator, the one that's experiencing the play, that internal revelation. The play's the thing wherein we'll catch the conscience of the king, mm-hmm. that, that, that there's something that's revealed uh, in the play that, that corresponds to something being, potentially being revealed in, 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 in the self. Um, there's a great Borges story a Night in Cordova. Have you mm, ever read that story? Not recently. Yeah. No, I don't remember um, it. He, you know, he's got Averroes, Ibn mm. Rushd, is reading um, the Poetics. Mm. And he's having a really hard time understanding, you know, what, what Aristotle's talking about. And because the Arab tradition did not have theater. Mm. And so he has to go to a dinner and he's not really happy about it, mm-hmm. but he, he, goes, he goes to the dinner and, and, and they're having a conversation about whether or not Jahali poetry was still relevant, right. this pre-Islamic poetry of the 7th, uh, 6th century and 7th century Arabia was relevant to Andrusians who were living mm. in a completely different culture. Mm. And he, he quotes, and you know, Borges is always mixing reality mm-hmm. with, with his own um, imagination, but he quotes a, a famous... Uh, poet Zuhair from the the uh, the Seven Odes, mm. and about that um, that he saw death like a blind camel, <laughs> that fate you know was like a blind camel. It just mm. it just stumbles. Mm. And uh, did did camels really have anything to do with us here in Cordoba? We're not. And so they're they're debating this. Mm. Then the the conversation turns to the this character who's just come back from from uh, Persia. Mm. And so they ask him, oh, what did, you, what did you see in Persia? So he starts talking about how he saw a play. Because mm. the, the Persians do have a tradition of um, passion plays. And, uh, and so they're asking, well, what's a play? Mm. And he begins to explain it's these people get together on a stage <laughs> and, they, and they act out a story. And, yep. and they're all like, that's ridiculous. Like, who... <laughs> <laughs> Who would believe something like that? Uh, and he said, well, that's just it. You start believing it. Yeah, you know, so you, indeed. the suspension of disbelief. And then, and then a light goes off in, in Averroes. He, yeah. he, he, he realizes what Aristotle was trying to convey. In his, it's a beautiful story. Oh, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to read it. <laughs> but that, that displacement, uh, which then allows us to recognize ourselves in characters and their actions who who resemble us but are not us i think is extraordinarily liberating right uh, i've more and more realized how difficult it is for any of us to understand ourselves without without some way of doing it in which we don't have to look directly at ourselves right and so the therapy of drama the therapy of both tragedy sure. and comedy actually it seems to me is that we're liberated from ourselves even as we're seeing 
uh, versions of ourselves in the in the mimetic in the mimetic world. I think Shakespeare is particularly good at that. Well, that's uh, one of the and greatest, that, obviously. Yeah. In, indeed, especially with respect to uh, getting his own play going and then establishing a play within a play. Right from which characters will learn or not learn about them about themselves it's an obsessive technique of his well and i think uh, way what for he, him to talk about and, his own and he's art. forcing us to to see the play within our own play i think he's you know he it's a platonic idea that that this is that there's something else going on alongside this no that's right this experience there's a whole spiritual dimension i mean midsummer's night's dream is a good example of that where he, he he's got all these dimensions alongside this dimension and the kind of sleepiness i mean that play had, and that's another play that had a huge i mean arguably when i was thinking about converting to islam i actually went and saw that play hmm. and and in some ways that was the play that convinced me to actually convert <laughs> you were converted by, to islam by, by midsummer's, midsummer's night's, night's dream. dream yeah because because i you know, I'd been in a head-on collision, and mm. and um, I really felt like I had, you know, it was a, a kind of a wake up. You know, I was only mm -hmm. seventeen, and and I really, according to the Highway Patrol, I should should not have survived the the crash, mm. but I did, and and it was very strange experience, like that I had after that. Mm -hmm. You know, for several days, I you know, I was like. Like, am I here? Is this mm -hmm. real? And, you felt spectral. Yeah, very, very strange experience. And um, when, when, when I, I really started studying religion seriously at that point, and I did that for about a year, and um, I went through, I mean, my mother had always told me that uh, she raised us, that religion was largely an arbitrary thing, that most people mm -hmm. just have the religion they were brainwashed into, mm -hmm. and um, they get entrenched in it, and this is the truth, because mm -hmm. I was born in, in Sri Lanka, and therefore I'm a Buddhist, or I'm a Hindu, or... It's a mere convention. Yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's a, it's a lot less solid ground than a lot of people mm -hmm. would like to think. Um, so I, I decided just to look at, at the different religions and what they had to say. What was it about the play, Midsummer Night's Dream? It was actually the end when Puck comes out and yeah. kind of says, you know, if we shadows have offended, think yeah. but this and all is mended. mended. Yeah, 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 that you've just slumbered here. There's just a dream. <laughs> That's right. And, and it was, I kind of felt like that car crash was like, it's time to wake up. And I, right. and I realized I could go back to sleep. And easily, and and it was. Do I set out to wake up and and make a, a conscious go of it with my life to use my life as a a a spiritual path of awakening to actually right. awaken to our true self, whatever that is. And and that's 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 what I um, I felt like. I felt I didn't have an option that I that I. I that I couldn't just go back to sleep. I, so. By the way, uh, what's fascinating? And it was it was it was the uh, it was a uh, it was in Santa Barbara, and it was it was actually uh, the Royal Shakespearean. They were there. So it was an actual so production. It was a production from England, and they were mm -hmm. really great. Yeah. The interesting thing about that about that play is that Bottom is the is the one character who can actually pass. Uh, from one order to another, right. and he actually uh, he actually goes from the human to the spirit world, you know, and then back again, and has some form of a relationship well, with uh, a quasi a quasi deity. Yeah. And I'm fascinated by that because he is the player. Well, he's the one who wants to play, play all, all the parts. Part. Well, says I can play all the parts. Uh, no, indeed, yeah. indeed. And so yeah. he's he's the most theatrical. Right. Yeah. And yet, uh, it might not be an accidental relationship you know, my, between his his theatricality yeah. uh, and his uh, and his spiritual distinctness mm. uh, that he actually can pass back and forth. And when he does pass uh, back, when he's uh, demetamorphosized right. right from ass to man again, yeah. he actually comes back. Uh, uh, revising uh, St. Paul. Uh, mm -hmm. He comes back with, with indeed a vision. 
And although he's not allowed to share that, uh, yeah. that vision mm. by Theseus, once they do the play within a play right. in, in Act 5, he's also uh, the one who can boss Theseus around at certain moments. Yeah. He actually speaks back to him. Sure. And I've more and more begun to think that he's the unacknowledged king, uh, if you will, of, of, that, of that play. And although at first it startled me uh, to hear you say that, that Midsummer Night's Dream played an important role yeah, in, uh, in your conversion, yeah. I actually think that that play uh, is seriously exploring exactly what it is that makes it possible for us to experience um, this order as not the only order. I totally agree. Yeah. And and to to pass, if mm. you will, back yeah. back and forth. Well, also, you know, my dad, um, who I I don't know anybody that would even come close to his knowledge of Shakespeare. He was convinced that Bottom was Shakespeare. Yeah. Like that he that was his. Yeah. That it, you know. I shall call it bottom's dream, for it hath no bottom. That 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 Shakespeare was able to dream impossible dreams and continue to dream throughout his life, and and that he the the imagination of, of no, he certainly the man he certainly is beyond belief. he certainly identifies with him. The play yeah. the play adores him. I've never seen a production, even bad productions, uh, during which. The mechanicals didn't bring down the house, yeah. uh, and bottom and bottom in particular. Yeah. But to take him seriously as a as a seer, or maybe yeah. even some kind of prophet, yeah. um, makes us realize that the stakes of poetry may be much higher than we realize. That these mere yeah. fictions are actually a form of spiritual training. Well, the muses uh, to, to catch yeah, no. to catch the impermanence, yeah. the theatrical yeah. quality actually yeah. of actual life. Well, the the uh, the Arabs believed that the the poet was uh, was possessed by mm -hmm. a, a, a genie. Mm -hmm. You know that the, the, um, there's actually a great. They they have a, a a group of Arab poets. They're called the outlaw poets. Outlaw poets. And and they really yeah. are. They're they're yeah. they're amazing characters. One of them was called Ta'abbata Sharra, which means he had evil under his arm. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> the, the genies he's carrying them around, but uh, the um, the uh, the outlaw poets were they were like the uh, the Dalits, you know they they were Mambudin, they were people that were, were expelled or had rejected the tribal alliances, mm -hmm. and they became a tribe for people without tribes, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. some of their poets are really really powerful, but. They, they definitely saw a relationship between, um, you know, the spiritual realm and poetry, that a true poet was, was somebody who was inspired, that there was something. Um, and, and undeniably, the importance of poetry is accentuated by the fact that the, there is an entire chapter in the Quran called The Poets. Mm. And, and, and it's recognized that, all of the chapter headings of the of the Quran are are momentous things. It's mm -hmm. only momentous things get uh, a chapter. Like the Jews are, there's a chapter called Beni Israel, mm -hmm. you know, because they're a momentous people. Mm -hmm. um, there's a chapter called the the uh, the the spider, mm -hmm. right? The ant. And even the Arabs ask, like, why is chapters named after these little creatures? And it's like because these are very very uh, profound little creatures that have great import, and uh, and it's calling attention to those things. Um, and it, and and the 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 verse about the poets in the Quran because they accuse the Prophet Muhammad of being a poet. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Amir Abdul Qadir Al Jazairi, one of the great um, scholars and a poet himself, and and he he fought the French in, in Algeria. And was actually honored in this country. There's a city in Iowa named after him, El Kader, mm. Iowa, because he saved uh, Christians that were being persecuted in Syria. But he he wrote a small book called Tanbih al Ghafil, um, which in it he argues that the reason prophets are accused of being poets is because of the similarity between prophecy and poetry. Mm. The poet, the Arabs have a beautiful expression for what a great poet does. They call it a sahal al which means the easy impossible. 
<laughs> <laughs> because it, it looks like I can do that. Yeah. But then when you try to do it, you fall short. And, and there's something about great poets. And I think, unfortunately for us, uh, lyric poetry, our poetry has been reduced to lyric poetry. Mm -hmm. and, and most because of free verse and the loss of prosody. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, or, you know, somebody like Mary Oliver is clearly capable of writing in verse if she wanted to. And she certainly knows the art but chooses to to write in in this free verse and i find free verse extremely interesting actually. it's undeniably Be interesting but i think it's a third category i think prose poetry and and to call it verse for me is problematic the arabs had a third category yeah. which is very similar to free verse which they call they had nadham and nathar and saja so mm -hmm. they had prose poetry and then they had a third category mm -hmm. which is more like rap Mm -hmm. um, today, it's it's kind of has internal rhymes, a lot of assonance, a lot of alliteration, but it's not metered and it's not um, it's not uh, rhymed in any formalized. I way. have a colleague who does some very interesting work on uh, Whitman, a poem I mm. uh, I, I love, and sure. she she argues, and I think it's uh, quite astute that we can think of poetry as uh, uh, as as meter, or we can think of poetry as line. Mm -hmm. So her argument is that free verse avails itself of an, any number of uh, formal properties of poetry, yeah. but that what's significant is the line is the line itself. Sure. And uh, Whitman, I think, is really quite remarkable for uh, achieving his measure mm. in in line, as opposed it, to to meter. Yeah, uh, and and, so and that it has a it has a rhythm. And in that sense, it's like it's like prose that has a rhythm, but because of the lineation, mm -hmm. uh, it's different. So I actually think it may be that free verse is the third category that you're. Well, that you're well I I mean I would argue that about. see Whitman who really starts the ball rolling. Um, Whitman, his is free verse. Mm -hmm. It's clearly versified, mm -hmm. but it's free. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of of what is called free verse today mm -hmm. that you can't, if you look at, you know, Captain, oh, Captain, that's mm -hmm. clearly got strong meter mm -hmm. in it. It's mm -hmm. just not fixed to any, you can't say, oh, this is pentameter or mm -hmm. tetrameter or mm -hmm. dimeter or what, what, you can't fix it. It's, mm -hmm. but it's clearly metered. Mm -hmm. He's got rhyme going. He's got, it's, and that's why I think what happens later, mm -hmm. um, when, when, when you have people like um, Ezra Pound, mm -hmm. because Pound, Pound is like Picasso. Picasso could do the realist mm -hmm. if he wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a mm -hmm. trained painter, mm -hmm. but he chose to do the abstract. Mm -hmm. and, and it made sense because photography had really replaced uh, realist art. Mm -hmm. um, but, but he could do that. Mm -hmm. And 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 Pound could could write in 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 meter. What a lot of people today are doing, they don't know how to write mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. in in meter in mm -hmm. in traditional forms, and so they're just doing. It's like modern dancing, where you just get out and do whatever you want. Whereas mm -hmm. all traditional dancing, you had to learn how to dance. Mm -hmm. The waltz is a very specific set, or the cha cha, or even you know ballroom dancing all those forms ha and this is i think this what this is the demarcation of the the modern and the pre-modern world mm -hmm. is that it it's there's a type of do what thou wilt it's the abbey of thalema mm -hmm. you know the 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 rejection of law mm -hmm. and order mm -hmm. and i'm going to be free mm -hmm. and and nobody's going to put constraints on me mm -hmm. and i think the problem with that and this is why it's very interesting that the great disciplines of our civilization are called the liberal arts. Mm -hmm. they're, they're the arts that free you. Because if, you, if I get on a piano and just start pounding away, mm -hmm. that's not music. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe George Antiel uh, thought it was, but it's not music. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but if I, if I discipline myself to master this thing, mm -hmm. then I'm free. That's right. To do whatever I want. And that's where I would, personally, I really feel that to, to, to encourage people to do these things without learning the rules mm 
then you're free to break the rules. It's like if I know grammar mm -hmm. and I choose like Dickens mm. to have a sentence with one word in it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't, the English teacher can say that's not a sentence because there's right. no subject and there's no predicate. Yeah. But Dickens knows what a sentence is, yeah. right? That's and right. if he chooses to make a sentence out of one word, he has every right to do that. He can break the rules because he knows the rules. And I think that's where I, I really, I think free verse has, has uh, destroyed poetry, personally. Uh, yeah, I don't agree. Uh, that's good. No, <laughs> but, I, I, uh, I wouldn't expect you to agree with me on that. <laughs> no, no, it but, just yeah. startled me when yeah. you came back to, the, uh, uh, to, to, that, to, that, to that point because I don't think that it's uh, fully free. I think, again, I think the, uh, the line is still a discipline. And what it's freed from is I think uh, if they know is, what they're doing is metrics. Yeah, no, that's that's right. But of most don't. That's but I my think point. that's always uh, always the case in the sense that um, only those who have mastered an art can transcend it. Uh, and in that sense, I am a traditionalist educationally, without a doubt. Um, but when you look, and I'm I'm identifying Whitman in particular because. Uh, of, he ends up uh, being uh, proof of something you said earlier when you were talking about the influence of the English Bible, especially the King James right. Version on, uh, on English and American literary culture, which is really hard to overestimate. I mean, he was a great reader uh, of, of the Bible, including the Psalms. And it's quite clear that he picks up a lot of his phrasing and clausing from uh, the English uh, uh, Psalms in, uh, in the King James, King James uh, version of the Bible. And so in many ways, I think Whitman is actually a traditionalist uh, that he not, I would agree. He not only I, studied no, the I, forms, but he, I, studied, yeah. he studied the great, the great books, if you, yeah. if you will. But, uh, but that's always the case, it seems to me, that the untrained tend to make for less compelling revolutionaries than the trained. Uh, they're the ones who are actually free enough not only to choose when to obey rules or yeah. not, but to invent new rules. My, my father wrote a book on prosody. Mm. And, uh, really? One of, his yeah, one of his lines in there was that he felt Robert Frost scored an ace when he said that free verse was like playing tennis without a net. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm just saying there were still lines. I, no, I agree. And that's what, <laughs> that my point about Whitman, I, I do. And if you take a, a poem like Kensington Gardens uh -huh. by Ezra Pound, uh -huh. I mean, that's as good as poetry gets as far as I'm yeah, concerned. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a poem of free verse. It's yeah. an incredibly powerful poem. But again, Pound knew what he was doing. Yeah. And... and, and my argument is that people are, are it's a default setting. When, when you don't know how to do something, and you go to the default setting of just doing whatever you can. And, and that's where I think you lose. Artifice is very important. Art, I mean, Absolutely. It's, the art is from ours, you know, power. We, yeah. the, the word for army is, is, is a cognate of art. Art is power, and, 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 and power comes about from discipline. It's, 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 it's accrued by, by discipline. Exactly A civilization right. that's undisciplined will never become a powerful civilization. And, and, and a writer who's undisciplined will never become a powerful writer. And that's why I think great poetry is always there. There's definitely the discipline is there. You can mm -hmm. feel it. And mm -hmm. somebody like, if you, if you take somebody like um, Cormac McCarthy is, mm -hmm. a, is a good example of that, who just from one point of view can drive you crazy with his punctuation, mm -hmm. but he knows exactly what he's doing mm -hmm. and he has a purpose behind that. I'd like to ask him if I ever met him. what About particular uh, moments? Yeah. yeah. Well, like what, what he's trying to convey in that usage, but... I really feel like we, our civilization has lost so much by the abandonment of rules. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things, and, and Nietzsche brings out this, um, this idea of the Apollonian and the Dionysian, mm -hmm. these two impulses. Mm -hmm. I, we've become such a Dionysian culture that we've lost the importance of the Apollonian that, 
that there's a balance between the two and wonderfully portrayed in Sense and Sensibility mm. with these two, Eleanor and Marianne. Mm. I mean, uh, Austin does an incredible job at showing us these two ways of being in the world mm -hmm. and, and, and how they're both, in essence, flawed. Mm. That, you know, the end where there's a recognition of the other's worth mm. and the beauty of the other. That they need one another. They need one another. And, and, and I think um, we have an interesting tradition in Islam, um, in, in Sufism, Tasawwuf, which is that the Sufi should be outwardly sober, but inwardly drunk or ecstatic. Mm. Mm. And, and I think that is, is that incredible balance of the Apollonian decorum, the idea mm -hmm. that decorum is important. I mean, one of the things that troubles me about modern culture is the complete loss of decorum, mm. the importance of, and Richard Weaver, I, I'm sure you're familiar with that, mm. the ideas have consequences. I think he was really getting at the heart of, of the crises that we're suffering from in the loss of a sense of hierarchy, that, that all of life has hierarchy, and, and to reduce and level, and I think that's one of the things about free verse to me, it levels, it makes everybody a poet, mm. because everybody can do it, mm. um, and, and, and then you lose something in, 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 the, in, 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 in the discipline that, that elevates one over the other, not in terms of a kind of um, inherent superiority, but in mm -hmm. an acquired superiority. The, the Confucian right. idea of the superior man was a man who had cultivated his character and his being. And, and, and that's, I think we've really lost that in our culture. And, 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 and I, think, I think that that loss of, of meaningful life, a life mm. of discipline that actually accomplishments are, are something that are relished because they were so hard earned. Mm. Um, when everything becomes easy, when all information, I mean, I can just look up the meaning of any poem on the internet. Mm -hmm. I can find out what meter it's in and what verse it's in. And I've, mm -hmm. I admittingly have done that before. We all have. I, exactly. But that something is lost. Mm. When everything well, becomes uh, I share your father's uh, admiration for uh, for Shakespeare and the way that I would approach what you're talking about, which I think is right. I mean, the loss of, of a sense of decorum uh, is a shame. Unfortunately, we think of decorum as uh, mere manners. Uh, we don't think of it as an ordering, uh, an ordering principle of some of some kind. But it's interesting that one of the reasons that decorum uh, got a legitimately bad name is that it too often was used in, uh, to, to support uh, social hierarchies. Right. But what's missed, I think, uh, in, in decorum, especially with respect to how to train poets, how to mm -hmm. teach poets, how to yeah. write poetry, how to teach people how to read it, is that the submission to a superior artist is how a lesser artist becomes a greater artist. And in fact, in, in Shakespeare's own example, it's very easy to see that early in his career he was heavily influenced by Christopher Marlowe. Uh, and he took Marlowe as uh, an object of imitation. It's quite clear. Uh, Marlowe, in great part because he died, uh, he died young, tends to have a verse less mature than the most mature of Shakespearean right. verse. But had, had he lived, we don't know where he would have ended up. That's right. And Shakespeare's own imitation of Marlowe mm -hmm. made it possible for him mm -hmm. to begin to do things that Marlowe did quite less, uh, quite less frequently. So, for example, Shakespearean meter tends to be much more regular uh, in the early part of his career, and then he starts to experiment with more and more interesting metrical substitutions, sure. for example. The line changes so that frequently he has end stop lines at the beginning uh, and, and relies much more heavily on rhyme itself. We, we think of him always writing blank verse when in fact there's a great deal of He's rhyme, got a lot of rhyme yeah. uh, in the earlier, frequently sure. in, the earlier, uh, in the earlier work. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, for example, uh, often has very interesting end rhymes uh, early early in the play. And so then you get this experiment with enjambment yeah. that actually comes to define the Shakespearean uh, line, which is really quite distinct. And so what I think we've lost 
uh, in 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 the very loss of decorum that you're that you're talking about is not the loss of submitting to illegitimate social authority um, because uh, let it let it go but the submission to legitimate artistic authority in which your training requires you to recognize uh, someone's artistic talent is so superior to your own that right. you need to pay attention mm -hmm. to learn how to how to do that and again intuitively we all we all know this Aristotle says in the poetics that the human being is the most mimetic of animals um, right and he says something very interesting that I've I've actually meditated when we know upon. mirror neurons we, we begin to actually mirror the person we're sitting with in trainment, the hearts begin to beat in, in, in sync with the people we're standing next to. No, exactly. Women who live in together, their periods synchronize. That's right. So that when young, uh, when young people are actually trying to learn something, of course, uh, they imitate their heroes. They play their guitar right. like their favorite uh, hero does. Right. They hold the bat that right. way. Yeah. You can always see a young person when they're when they're imitating. Dylan was imitating James Dean, Charlie Chaplin. That's Woody exactly Guthrie. right. Right. But that is itself. But then he became who he was. Yeah, it wasn't just that he became that, but he became it by, in a sense, mastering his master. Sure. I, I once saw uh, a, a uh, documentary on on one of my favorite lyricists, Hank Williams. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hank Williams could imitate these two singers. Mm -hmm. And he said he realized that he had to find his own voice. Mm -hmm. He said, so I got right in between them. <laughs> and, then in, and then in the documentary, they showed the two singers uh -huh. and they blended their voice and it was Hank Williams. Huh. It's just amazing. Remarkable. Uh, so again, mimesis. Like he yeah. was, uh, Toynbee goes in great detail about the mimetic importance of mimesis in a civilization. But that's the, that, I think, is the paradox of originality and of finding one's There's own voice. There's nothing original, yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. Until one masters uh, um, another artist one is imitating and then feels compelled to, to innovate. And at that point, I think newness is born. Uh, the truth of the matter is, before Shakespeare, the Shakespearean line... Uh, of extraordinary metrical uh, volatility and uh, of, of varied pacing it's because amazing. of it's incredible. It's new. Yeah. It's new. The oh, language. He did things. The language was, He invented words. He was constantly inventing words. It was. It was a amazing. new. It was yeah. a new language. And then we think about somebody like like Milton, who's paying a great deal of attention then to 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 Shakespeare, much less so to Marlowe, mm. and he himself realizes that that. Uh, metrically volatile in jammed line is something that he himself can do in, in paradise in paradise mm -hmm. lost in his epic poem but he there finds that uh, the Shakespearean syntax is not complicated enough for the for the what reflections and the actions sure. that he wants to represent right. and his well, own Latinate his own Latinate training right. uh, uh, at, at uh, university drives him to then uh, create a Miltonic style that's mm. distinctly, distinctly his, his own. own yeah. But I agree, the, the liberal arts tradition uh, is a tradition that's ultimately liberating. Mm. But proximately... Through discipline. That's right. Yeah. But proximately, it requires uh, discipline. Right. And and uh, and submission, right. and the submission, the submission to a discipline, I think, is something that's a great gift to young people. Whether it's the discipline that, of music, that's, that's my point. Athletics, yeah. Yeah. poetry, because that kind of mastery yeah. empowers them yeah. much more, much more fully than uh, how shall I put it, less disciplined forms sure. uh, forms of expression. You know, Frost said the the. the Life is, is a series of disciplines, and the first one is the acquisition of language, of words, and even the nuances of words and the meanings of words. And poets, great poets, they know their words so well, mm -hmm. and, 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 they, and, they, and they reveal that. And you know, Shakespeare, Sister Mary and Joseph, I, I think, compellingly shows the, in the indebtedness of Shakespeare to artifice, to, to mastering... Oh, uh, the the books of rhetoric of his time mm -hmm. and and Marshall McLuhan in, in his book on the trivium uh, 
the Elizabethan age, which created the greatest English literature that we have, was an age of, of rhetoric. That's what they were doing. And, and that's why I, I really feel, you know, just uh, to, to close this out, I think what you did with the Office of Assertion, because I'd been looking for a book for freshmen, because there's a couple of things about uh, our college um, students today. They don't know English grammar because they didn't go to grammar school, which to me is a crime against a young person. And, and two, uh, they, they really struggle with writing, partly mm-hmm. because they don't know grammar, but more importantly because they don't know topics of invention. They don't know how ideas are generated. Mm-hmm. And the, the discipline of rhetoric and what you did with that very short but incredibly rich little book was... Um, to really give a student uh, in a very short and concise way uh, the essence of writing uh, a, a good essay. And I think the essay in the end um, about Telemachus and, and mm-hmm. from, from the Odyssey is proof uh, in the pudding. So well, I appreciate that a great deal. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, it, I mean, that's how we ended up uh, connecting and, and you've now written for the journal and uh, hopefully it'll, you know, it'll continue the, the dialogue. So um, I, I want to really thank you just for coming out. We're here at, at the upper campus at Zaytuna College. And, and I also for inviting me out to the University of Dallas. I really enjoyed it. Your hospitality was wonderful and meeting all those people. And hopefully we'll do that again here something similar to that. So we, we hope so. And yeah. I wanted to thank you and the community at Zaytuna right. for, for having me today. It was a delight. Yeah, great. All right. Mm-hmm.